I want you to be reminded that your birth was a problem. Mm -hmm. I know you call it your birthday, but hell calls it a problem day. Somebody was just born that can possibly be a problem to my kingdom if they ever have a king encounter. So I'm going to go old school. Old school, they used to say high five, but since we're in a pandemic, can I get you to fist bump somebody and say, your birth was a problem. Your, your birth was a problem. You are here to solve a problem. You are here to solve a problem. And look, y'all, usually I give you a whole lot. I'm like drenched. And then towards the middle of my sermon, I say, okay, now I want to speak from this topic. But I'm going to give it to you up front. I want to speak around this thought from this subject for a few moments. This Sunday afternoon, I've been looking for this. I've been looking for this. Is there anybody? Have you ever lost your keys? Or have you ever lost a remote? Like a remote makes it to where you have trust issues with everybody. Y'all know, so you seen the remote? Have you seen it? Are you sitting on it? Get up. Like, you got trust issues with everybody. What if I were to tell you that God is looking for something in the earth? God is looking for something, and I believe throughout this sermonic journey on this afternoon, you are going to discover that what he is looking for is you. So, Father God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for being awesome. Thank you for allowing us to have a moment in time when we could come together and hear your word. All the study, all the prayer means absolutely nothing if you aren't seen, if you aren't glorified, if you aren't magnified. We have lifted up worship just saying, God, come in this house and flood this atmosphere. Even those watching online, I pray that they will start a house fire even in their home. There will be a fire that will hit their heart. There will be a fire that will hit their marriage. There will be a fire that will hit their singleness. Even though there's distance, there is no distance with you. Would you do it, God? Light our hearts on fire, and I thank you that you will anoint me and use me as your oracle, as your PA system. In Jesus' name, and everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout in the room, amen. Amen, amen and amen. We are now in lesson number seven. We have been seven weeks in this thing. We are now in installment number seven of this amazing sermon series entitled King Encounters. Has it been blessing anybody? Amen. King Encounters. Oh, y'all ain't gonna like this. Um, outside of and apart from each and every week striving to give us biblical, soul-edifying content, not by my own efforts, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that one of the things that God is trying to show us, yes, when you encounter Jesus, it is always followed by a life change. Yes, when a woman or a man meets Jesus, it is always followed by a life change. But another objective on why I believe the Holy Spirit has us doing this series is because God wants to reintroduce us to an accurate biblical version of what a Christ follower truly is. I'm trying, sis. Not a cultural definition of a Christian, not your mama's definition of a Christian, not Hollywood's definition of a Christian, not your mama and them and your papa and them definition of a Christian. I believe the Holy Spirit is using this series to show us an accurate biblical version of what a Christ follower truly is. It's sad to say it, but I think some of us need to be reintroduced to what a Christian truly is. Because a Christian is one that is Christ-like, not one that likes Christ. Okay? Now listen. The first time you even see the word Christian in the scriptures is at Antioch. They were first called followers of the way. Then they were called believers, and then they were called Christians in the book of Acts. And it was not given to them as a badge of honor like we do today. The word Christian was actually formulated out of mockery. 
They were like these people, <laughs> these people over there, they, they, they look kind of like that Jesus dude. You know that dude who's talking about the kingdom of heaven is like, they kind of act like that Jesus. Yeah, Th- These people, these remnant of people, they're coming together and they're following the teachings of Jesus. They're, they're following the principles of Jesus. They're trying to act like Jesus. <laughs> Those must be Christians. They were labeled Christians because it was so obvious. I hope y'all are getting this. It was so obvious that they were like Christ that they labeled them a Christian. And my concern this afternoon is if people look at our life, will they make the same assumption? That must be a Christian. Not because of your lip service, but because of your lifestyle. Can people look at our fruit and see that we are truly a Christian? Because like I told us, God in the bio does not mean God in their life. It's going to get quiet, I know. Uh, just because she has hashtag Proverbs 31 in the caption, that doesn't mean she's anything like Proverbs 31. Just be, ooh, a lot of us are guilty of identity theft. We're using somebody's name that we don't belong to. Now don't shoot the messenger. Jesus said it himself in Luke chapter 6. Why do you call me Lord, but yet don't do what I say? (laughs) Preaching like this will clear out some churches because we've been inspired to death and motivated to death and joked to death. But what if the Holy Spirit said, no, I want some Christians in the earth like for real. Like for real. Y'all see that? I want some Christians in the earth for real. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Well, well. Pastor, he know a whole lot of Bible. I I mean, I've never met a man that quotes so much scripture like that. Please don't be deceived. I ain't never met a girl like her, bro. I mean, she praying over me, and she quoting scripture. You know what I'm saying? This one different. She wifey, though. Please do not be impressed because somebody can quote scripture. The devil can quote the Bible. Don't be deceived. Listen, y'all. Deception is a predator's disguise. Woo! Deception is a predator's disguise. Don't you remember in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan started to tempt Jesus and Jesus gave the devil Bible. He said, it is written, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then Satan was like, okay, playboy, I got you. All right, let me take you to the highest point. Um, If you're the son of God, jump off this mountain because it is written. That the angels will be in charge over you and you won't dash your foot against the stone. Are y'all seeing this? In this particular passage, Satan and Jesus are both quoting scripture at each other. (laughs) And you impressed that somebody quotes scripture? (laughs) This reveals to me something very powerful. And that is information doesn't mean transformation. Oh, Hollywood lied to us. Culture lied to us. You know why? Because they told us knowledge is power. False. Applied knowledge is. How is it power if you know it but you don't apply it? Y'all don't want to talk to me. Information does not mean transformation. You can quote scripture. You could exegete scripture like you could be eloquent with your hermeneutics. You could even have great theological retention and still not know Jesus. Can quote scripture better than anybody else and still not know the king of glory. If I'll be honest and put myself on front street, I've done it. There were times in my life I could quote scripture. I memorized scripture. I knew the text, but I did not have a prayer life. And I did not spend time with God. And I was not seeking his face. Oh, I feel judged. (laughs) The difference with me is mine's used to, is yours. Okay. All right. (laughs) I didn't know him. Just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were great at quoting scripture. But we're poverty stricken with applying it. It's amazing to me how we can quote so much Bible. We could just quote so much scripture, but then compromise. And I'm not saying you're perfect. I told us all throughout this series, all throughout this series, you won't be sinless, but you will sin less, right? 
I just believe when you seek God's face, you should start becoming more spiritually mature. The more that you have a devotion time, you should start to see some spiritual growth. The, the more that you attend a place that is called a church, you should start to experience spiritual evolution. There's a problem if you're going to a place 52 weeks out of a year every single Sunday and you are never challenged to spiritually mature. It's amazing. Like, we turn into a judge when we know somebody's flaw. But then, oop, we turn into a lawyer when they know ours. <laughs> See, see, like we're a judge, Judge Judy, Judge Matt, like we're a judge when we know somebody else's flaw. But, oh, you sure are a cold lawyer when they know yours. This is why I believe we should be gracious to everybody. Because from the pulpit to the pew to watching online, all of us have a chapter in your story that you don't want read out loud. See, y'all see that? Y'all see that? Ola, can y'all put like some hand claps in the room? We all, Jerry included, we all have a chapter in our story that you would not want read out loud. <laughs> Information doesn't mean transformation. Know the word. You memorize scripture. You have it on your IG and your caption. But horrible character. Quote a lot of Bible. I was at church today, terrible character, but I'm the man of God. I'm a prophet of God. Okay, bro. For starters, kingdom men have practiced zipper control. Oops. Do you have that one, though? Do you have that one? Oh, it's getting quiet. Thank you, Lord. It's getting quiet. I mean, we post so much biblical scriptures online, but don't have biblical love in real life. Like, okay. Nobody's impressed that you can speak in tongues, but you speak mean in English, right? Mean in Espanol, mean in Spanish, mean in Portuguese, or whatever your native tongue is. Nobody's impressed by that. Where they do that at, though? <laughs> this is what I like to call Christian atheism. It's an oxymoron, isn't it? Christian atheism. When we claim to be Jesus, but then live like it doesn't exist. Information does not mean transformation. And there's something that I understand now. You can have more degrees than a thermostat go before your name. You could know how to have hermeneutics and theological surgical skills when it comes to the scriptures. But if there is no love there. If there is no grace there, if there is no kindness there, if there is no honesty there, or how about this one? If there is no realness there, no authenticity there, because it is better for you to be real than for you to appear to be right. Nobody's talking to me. Nobody's talking to me. If there is no power there, if there's no fire shop in my bones there, if my degrees are present... If my accolades are present, if my notoriety is present, if my position is present, but my king is absent, all I will ever be is impressive, but I won't be impactful. And I'm not trying to impress anybody on today. I'm not trying to impress anybody online. Is there anybody like, I'm not trying to be impressive. I don't want my gift to take me to a place where my character demotes me. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to rid my life of filth and rid my life of ungodliness and rid my life of sin and rid my life of recklessness and rid my life of thirsting over sewage instead of thirsting over the living water. I want the Spirit of God to anoint my mouth so that every single time I preach, God can use my tongue as his paintbrush and artistically and accurately paint on the canvas of men's hearts I'm not trying to be impressive I want to be impactful I'm a flawed imperfect man that needs Jesus there is nothing impressive about me it's ordinary for you to try to be impressive I don't want to impress anybody but I want God to impact everybody so God whatever you have to do to get me to stop striving to be impressive 
but use me where I could be impactful. I don't want to just be active. I want to be effective. God, would you use me and change my perspective? Because listen, y'all, information doesn't mean transformation. But watch this. Information put into application leads to transformation. I wonder who under the sound of my voice, you frustrated because you're asking God for transformation. Because you told him a whole lot of your information, but you have no application. You can quote a lot of information, and that's great, and you expect other people to have transformation. But when you look at your own life, there is no application. Oh, I told y'all he switched my message, so this is just strictly him. I want us to be able to understand that God wants us to follow him for real. For real. Like, not just come and give God your Sunday. I want you to Sunday night. I want you to on Monday. Like, oh, I want you on Tuesday. I want you on Wednesday. I don't want to be like some courtrooms. I don't want you to just have weekend visits. I want to have full custody. I want to have full custody because there's something that I want to do in your life. Is there anybody that says, I don't want to be normal? I don't want to be mediocre? God, okay. I'm just convinced. Y'all have to excuse me. Is there anybody in the sanctuary that believes I was not cosmically created to be born, pay bills, and die? Anybody? Or have we gotten so accustomed to average that your whole frustration in your life is about bills and what you want? I, I just, I'm just convinced if it's just five of us that believe I was not created to be born, pay bills, and die, but I was created to give God the glory. Like ordinary clothes don't fit you anymore. To be petty, that's ordinary. That doesn't fit anymore. To curse people out, that's petty. That doesn't fit anymore. You tried it, but that's why it's so tight. <laughs> You're trying to fit into it, but that's why the conviction hits so tight. Because this is an ordinary outfit, and you have not been cosmically created to wear this. Ooh, your ex is an outdated outfit. And don't you dare let loneliness lie to you and cause you to reach out to something that left your mental health on life support, that left your spiritual growth on life support. Stop trying to wear ordinary outfits when you have been called to live for an extraordinary king. That's just the first thing we see. (laughs) That's just the first thing we see from this conversation with Satan. And Jesus, information doesn't mean transformation. The second thing I see is the devil knows the Bible. But that gave me like some type of joy. You know why? Because it made me think about haters. Have y'all ever noticed that haters always leave out the good part? Like, have you ever had somebody bad mouth you, but they left out all the times you were good to them? Like, you left out that I helped you with rent. Like, you helped out when you had nowhere to stay. You know, I got your back. You, you, you left out that I helped you move. You helped out that I caught your tears. Why you leave out all the good parts? And then I thought, okay, hold on. The devil knows the Bible. This means he knows that he's a defeated foe. He knows that you have been given the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. He knows that you got the victory. He knows that you have power over him. He knows that God has chosen you. He knows that you got a hedge. He just leaves out the good part when he's talking to you. When he's deceiving you in your head, he just leaves out the good part. When he's trying to manipulate you in your thoughts, he just leaves out the good part because he knows the Bible. So I'm like, okay, God, when we meet Jesus, yes, I get it. When we meet Jesus, it is always followed by a life change. Not always instantly, but rather incrementally, okay? And so what I feel God wants us to deal with this afternoon, I know it's him. You know why? Because I already knew 
what part seven of the series was before I preached part six. I felt like I was a man being directed by God. And on Tuesday night, when I opened up my laptop and start trying to conjure up and develop the content for today, it wasn't coming. I mean, that cursor was just like, click, 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 click. And I'm like, okay, we're in this kingdom, this king encounter series, God. You know, I don't ever want to come up here and look stupid. So I already thought you led me this direction, but nothing was coming. Nothing was coming at all. No content, no information that I want to put in the application that I pray I could preach and bring forth transformation in you. Nothing. And I learned six years ago, six years ago, this is why I never minimize your process. I learned six years ago, whenever you are engaged in sermon prep and it feels like the content is not flowing, don't start doubting your gift. Don't stop doubting if you're called. You need to raise up your spiritual antenna and say, okay, God, what do you want to say? Because maybe what I was going to say is something that you don't want me to say. So I never want to be a minister or a pastor that preaches flesh. We have enough of that. I don't want to preach my opinion. I don't want to come before you and preach a message that was forced. God, I want to be under an open heaven. Why aren't you giving me information? It's because God wants to say something different. He wants to say something different. I felt like he was playing with me too. You know number seven is my number. You know I like seven, 12, and 40, and three. Those are like my numbers. I want you to inform my people that I want to do wonders in their life. Like, I want to take them higher. Listen, a lot of them view me wrong. Yeah, you've been preaching. A king encounter is followed by a life change. But hold up. I think they need to understand. I want to take them to higher heights. I want to take them to deeper depths. Like, I want to do something so abnormal in their life. But my children have settled for normal living. And anytime you settle, whatever settles always ends up at the bottom. Why are you down there? Why are you down there? Come up here. I want to take you to another height. I want to take you to another realm. I want to take you to another altitude. I want to take you to another dimension. I want to take you from glory to glory. You want revival? You must first be a revived people. You want a movement? You have to first be a moved people. You can't have a movement if you don't have people who have been moved. If you're not moved to repentance, if you're not moved to worship, if you're not moved to seek his face, how many of us are expecting a movement, but God's saying, you haven't been moved. You haven't been moved. I want them to know that normal is not your pedigree. Can I get us to say that? Normal is not my pedigree. Can y'all talk to me? Normal is not my pedigree. I want you to know that normal It's not what I'm looking for. I want to do something abnormal. Oh, I do. But it's normal for you to be bitter. That's normal. It's normal for you to be stuck on the inside due to what happened to you six years ago. That's normal. That's normal. That's why I articulated on Therapy Thursday, whenever we don't forgive and we are bitter, Not forgiving is punishment we give ourselves due to somebody else mishandling our heart. Did y'all hear me? Whoever's mad at somebody or hasn't forgiven somebody, you're just punishing yourself due to somebody else mishandling your heart. So what you're going to do is, is you're going to wake up every single day and punish yourself and miss out on the beauty of today due to what happened yesterday. Not forgiving is punishment you give yourself. So you're going to walk around looking like this all day. I love Jesus, though, but looking like something stinks. You ever seen those people sometime in church just looking? Like, are you glad that you're saved? Are you glad that your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life? So you're going to punish yourself to where it manifests on your face. Because you haven't forgiven what mama did. It's just punishment that you're giving yourself due to somebody else mishandling your heart. And dopamine hits aren't therapists for our brokenness. They're not. That dopamine hit of weed, that, that, that's not a therapist for what you're really going through. 
that dopamine hit of alcoholism, that's not a therapist for what you're really going through. You're trying to find comfort, but that's not going to work. That dopamine hit of shopping, that's not going to help and deal with what's really going on on the inside. That cheap sex, that dopamine hit, that's not really going to give you comfort in your soul. It's not. That dopamine hit of trying to figure out a way to escape this pain, it's not going to give you true comfort. Or what about the dopamine hit of overeating? Trying to find pleasure. Talk, Holy Ghost. Trying to find comfort because of what you're going through. There is no comfort in this life that could comfort you like the Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I want to show you all this. Let me give you a Bible. John chapter 14, verse 26. Look at this. But the comforter. Can I get somebody to say comforter? And just in case you're confused on who that is, which is the Holy Ghost. Whom the Father will send you in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So God is saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is what's going to comfort you. And you know how that's going to give you comfort? Because when you're going through, it's going to remind you what I said about you. So good, y'all. When you're going through, my Holy Spirit, have you ever been sad or upset about something and just a scripture just comes back to your head? Just randomly, that should give you comfort. I can give you more Bible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all. What's that word? What's that word? What's that word? Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by. How are you going to comfort somebody else if you don't have the comforter? See, this is why I know God led me to do therapy Thursdays. Because we can't even fulfill this biblical requirement because we haven't experienced the comfort of God ourselves. This scripture just said, comfort others who are in trouble. But how are you going to comfort others who are in trouble on how you got out of trouble if you don't have the comfort of yourself? God wants us to understand that normal is not your pedigree. It's normal for you to let the spirit of fear cause for you to be barren. That's normal. It is normal for us to be prayerless. It's normal for our Bibles to be dust collectors. It's normal to hear sermons that don't actually preach to you the gospel, but preach to you jokes. That's normal. It's normal for me to be an uninvolved parent. That's normal. It's normal for me to take chase after other women. That's normal. It's normal for me to be mad because I'm dealing with the red flags that I ignored because I'm not seeking God's face. It's normal for me to be angry when I'm not getting my way. That's all your anger is. It's your way screaming, I'm not getting my way. And that's why you're so angry. That's, that's normal, but normal is not your pedigree. What if... Our preferences and normal living is calling is causing for us to press decline to the call of purpose. Yeah. Or better yet, I wonder, have you allowed your obedience to be sent to voicemail because the call ID is not your preference? Mm -hmm. God's trying to do something, but you keep sending your obedience to voicemail. Because the call ID is not your preference. And here's the thing about average living. Average living will always cause us to choose places, spaces, and people that require for us to leave the next level version of ourselves behind. Did y'all hear me? Normal living will always cause us to choose spaces, places, and people that require for you to leave the next level version of you behind. You can't level up over there. Because over there is normal. I'm like, okay, God, okay. What, what, what's, what, what is this about normal? And normal is, is not your pedigree. I'm like, no, I need them to really get this. Normal living has caused for a lot of us to read the script from the film of Average. And when you constantly keep auditioning for this film, you will always live at a level that's beneath you. 
Normal. Normal living. Normal. Is there anybody that says, I'm canceling the audition. I'm not trying to continue a pattern of dysfunction. That's normal in my bloodline. I'm breaking it. Is there anybody? So I was like, okay, I get it. Normal. But what are you trying to say? I need them to know that I'm looking for somebody in the earth. Please hear me, y'all. I'm looking for somebody in the earth who is loyal to me so I could show off in their life. You told them that having a king encounter comes with life change. I want them to know if you are expecting a life change, but your heart is not loyal to me, you won't experience my breakthrough. Look, I'm going to give you Bible, y'all. Second Chronicles chapter 16. Look, I want you to see this, please. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. This blessed me on Friday night because I understand God is saying we have been viewing him wrong. He is literally looking who is faithful to me where I could show off in their life. Who is being honest and seeking my face so I could show off in their life? I want to do something mighty. I want to blow your mind. I want to show off through somebody. I'm not trying to look and punish you and make your life hard and throw you in the hell. That was made for Satan and his demons, not you. It's just we live like them, so there's no different. I can't differentiate between you and the enemy. But hell wasn't made for you. I'm looking for somebody to bless. I'm looking for somebody to blow their mind. I'm looking for somebody I can show myself self strong through. I'm looking for somebody to do the miraculous. I'm looking for somebody to do something powerful. I'm looking for somebody. But the requirement is they got to have a loyal heart. So yeah, meeting me comes with life change. But if they don't have a heart that's faithful, they're never going to experience me blowing their mind. And y'all, this... this the best way I could explain it, it's almost like a philanthropist is looking around to donate to somebody. I'm, who, who has a loyal heart so I can give all this to? There's so many things I want to do, and you're crying about what you don't have. And God's like, man, if I just get your heart, though. Have y'all noticed in the scriptures when God speaks about sin? It's like he always refers to it as cheating on him. It's like some sexual cheating when we don't obey him. I'm going to give you Bible so y'all won't think I'm just talking about this. Look, um, James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, you adulterous people. <laughs> you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or what about Judges chapter 2, verse 16? Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders, yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. Or what about 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 25? And it says, And they have transgressed against the God of their fathers. They went whoring after other gods. It's like God correlates this stuff to like sexually like cheating on him. <laughs> so I, I want you to engage in kingdom living. And what is kingdom living? Kingdom living is when scripture is your highest authority. Love, your greatest quality. Evangelism and evolution is your priority. That's so good, y'all. I'm going to say it one more time. Kingdom living is when scripture is your highest authority. Love is your greatest quality. And evolution and evangelism is your priority. God has said, I want to do mind-blowing things in their life. I need them to understand I'm not sitting up here ready to just like smash you. You're not obeying me? <laughs> you don't get my blessings. Listen, because some of us have a wrong view of God. We view him as mean, as ready to just throw you in the hell. I'm showing you the scripture, guys, like, I'm looking for somebody. 
I could show myself strong through. But the requirement is they have to have a loyal heart. And I don't know how I missed it. I don't know how I missed that there is a marriage between faithful hearts and the miraculous. I don't know how I missed it that there is a marriage between faithful hearts and healing. I'm going to give you more, Bob, to prove it to you. Oh, I hope y'all are getting this. Look, Matthew chapter 9, we read this last week. Matthew chapter 9, verse 22. This is the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all remember her, right? Look at this. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Did y'all catch that? Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Another king encounter. Luke chapter 17, verse 19. And he said to him, Arise, go on your way. There it is again. Your faith has made you well. Are y'all seeing this? This was messing me up Friday because I'm recognizing, oh, Lord, the faithful one is positioning himself to be discovered by faithful people. The faithful God is saying, if you're filled with faith, I'm going to make sure that I delay Jairus on purpose because somebody who has faith is going to run into the one who is faithful. I'm going to intentionally cross their path to make sure that the faithful can meet the faithful one. This is so good, y'all. Luke chapter 18, verse 42. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. There it is again. Your faith has made you well. Or what about Luke chapter 18, verse 8? I tell you, he will see they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I'm trying to help us, y'all. I'm trying to help us because I want us to understand the key to get the blessing is for you to have a heart that's faithful. You're praying for God to do this, and you're praying for God to do that. And I don't want to be guilty of ministerial injustice. God hears your prayers, but you won't get it if your heart's not loyal. I think the most annoying symbol in the world, and if it's not for you, y'all could judge me freely, but one of the most annoying symbols in the world, can we put this, this symbol on the screen? Has anybody like ever opened up their laptop or opened up their iPad? Have y'all ever seen this? This is one of the most irritating, annoying, frustrating signals in the world. I have connected to Wi-Fi. I have disconnected to use my cellular network. And every single time I keep on going to this website or trying to use this app, I keep getting this. <laughs> it's like this loading symbol. But this loading symbol been preaching to me. Anytime you get this symbol, it's really for two things. You know what? When you get this symbol, it means number one, um, you have too many tabs open. I'm letting it marinate. Say lie. You have too many tabs open. Somebody get my laptop, my, uh, my iPad. It's back there in the back with Carl. It's in my backpack. I want y'all to see something. Get my iPad. It means you have too many tabs open. You want something else to arrive, but you have too many tabs open you have too many doors open and due to all of these doors open thank you so much sis due to all these doors open every time you open up your ipad you keep getting that symbol and i just was thinking i was like you know i wonder how many doors of lust we have open how, how many how many doors of anger do we have open like how many doors of just resentment do we have open I wonder are you asking God for blessings but your life looks like this wow. just got all these tabs open just all of them and you, why is this so slow and God said if you can close this door if you can close the, the door of porn it's not about legalism it's you tired of this right you tired of that, right? Well, maybe if you can close the door of maybe get off Netflix, maybe uh, even cancel your subscription because you could finish a Netflix series, but you can't finish a Bible reading plan. Mm. Just, just for this season. Let, let's close that out. 
You have all of these tabs open. What if our life, we just start to close all the doors that could possibly be limiting us? Look at all this stuff I have on. Look at all these thoughts that are keeping you up during the night. Look at all these games you've been playing. Look at all these activities you've been at. Look at all these text messages you've been reading. What if the reason your blessing is stuck in transit is because you have so many tabs open? Now you're angry at God, and the conviction of this sermon is hitting to where your back of your neck is hot. <laughs> He's like, man, I don't like this, and I'm trying to show you. Literally, this is a true story. My sister was about to buy a brand new iPad. Am I telling the truth? Telling the truth. She said, yeah, I'm going to go to the store and buy me a new iPad. I said, why? She said, man, everything is slow. Everything, look, every time I open it, it gives me this. And I said, close your tabs. She said, what's that? <laughs> I said, like your tabs, like if you've opened up another app, you, you have to like swipe up and you'll see that there's a tab that you, that you need to close. She said, I never did that before. I said, so you had that iPad for two years and you have never closed the tab? You have never closed a tab, and now you're about to pay for something new when the answer is just closing your tab. Don't judge her too much. We have been praying and asking God for something for two years, but God's like, you still are communicating with that person? You still are watching this? You still, okay, y'all don't want to talk to me, but you frustrated with this. You know what else this also means? It also means you're not connected right. Talk, Holy Ghost. <laughs> You're not connected right. Could you be so far from your spiritual modem, from your spiritual provider, that you're trying to operate in things and you keep getting this because you're too far from me? I only hear from you when you want something. I only hear from you when you're in a pandemic. I only hear from you when you're in a crisis. You're too far. Oh, but if you start to get close, if you start to seek my face, Maybe your blessing is stuck on loading and stuck in transit because we have no relationship out of, outside of what you want. Outside of what you want. I am your Santa Claus Savior. You bring me your wish list. But you don't bring me your heart. You know what else this means? Something's coming. Doesn't it? I'm trying to gather the information so that you can see it. On this side, all you see is that. But on the other side, whatever you're trying to get access to, I'm working on it. Whatever you're trying to seek, I'm working on it. And all of this is important because God is trying to get us to understand, I want hearts that are loyal. This is not just a New Testament conversation. In the Old Testament, when Abraham was like, yo, God, hold up. But, but before you do this with Sodom and Gomorrah, what, what if there's some, some holy people there? Uh, God, hold on. You, you, you're doing 90 and 30. What if there's some faithful people there? I want y'all to see this scripture. I'm going to hop towards the end of it. Genesis chapter 18, verse 26. Abraham is just having this conversation with God, trying to convince him like, yo, don't destroy the city if there are faithful people there too. But in Genesis chapter 18, verse 26, look at this, y'all. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up and said, all right, cool. Uh, now, now, what if, if I be so bold? What if, Lord, even though I'm dust and ashes, what if the number of righteous is five less than 50? What, what if it's five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? God says, if I find 45 people who are righteous there, who are loyal there, I will not destroy it. Okay, God. Okay. All right. What if they're 40? <laughs> Abraham's, Abraham's pushing it. He said, okay, what if there's 40? God said, I won't even do it if there's 40. All right, God, don't get mad at me. We have verse 30, but I'm kind of like paraphrasing. We can get it. Uh, don't get mad at me, Lord, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30. 
All right. Um, if I be so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if I find 20 can be found there? He said, Abram, I won't do it if I find 20 people. All right, God, don't be angry at me. But I just want to know, uh, just one more time, if, 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 if there are 10 people there, will you spare the city? I won't destroy the city if I can find just 10 people who are loyal. Look, y'all. God, what if there's 30? What, what if there's 20? God, what, what if there's 10? I won't destroy the city if I can find just 10 people whose heart is loyal towards me. You know what this means, y'all? This is an undertaught aspect. Loyalty provides you with a hedge. See, somebody didn't catch it. Somebody didn't catch it. Look, look. God said, if I find just Tim, the whole place will experience a hedge because of your faithfulness to me. Some of us, you don't even recognize your whole job is experiencing a hedge because of your loyalty. Your whole community is experiencing a hedge because of your loyalty. Your whole household is experiencing a hedge because of your loyalty. This whole church is experiencing a hedge because of somebody's loyalty. God's saying, I, I won't do it if I could just find 10 people who are faithful to me. Y'all, this is powerful. I'm like, the whole city of Houston will be spared if I can get just 10 out of the, what, four-something million? The fourth largest city in America? If I can get just 10 people who are loyal, everybody will experience my protection. And you're telling me you won't pray? You won't seek his face? See, this, this is an undertaught issue. The reason I know we need to talk about this is because a lot of us assume somebody should be loyal. Okay, you're not going to like me, but I'm going to mess you up for a few seconds. If somebody gets married, we assume, husband, be faithful. That's just what husbands do. Wife, that's your husband, be loyal. That's just what husbands do. You have taken an oath to protect and serve your county law enforcement. That is just what you're supposed to do. And I'm trying to give you a shocking illumination. Words don't change hearts. All right? Words do not change hearts. The value and the ethic of faithfulness must be taught, not assumed. You hear so many sermons about the faithfulness of God. His faithfulness is not on trial. We hear sermons about you be faithful. But does anybody wonder how? I'm told to be faithful to God. But, but how do I actually do that? What does, what does faithfulness actually look like? What does a heart of loyalty to God actually look like? This is so real, y'all. Where it doesn't shock us if somebody's disloyal. What shocks us is loyalty. <laughs> like, fake people don't shock us anymore. Real ones do. How, how, how do I experience loyalty? How, how do I actually get a heart that is faithful to God? Number one, we have to understand faithfulness is an attribute of God. All right. Faithfulness is an attribute of God. This is for those people who just feel like, I'm loyal. I've always been loyal. That's just who I am. Forget what you're talking about, preach. Like, I'm just, I'm just a ride or die. I'm faithful. I'm loyal. That's just me. That's just who I am. You don't come out your mother's womb possessing a godly attribute. See? See? You don't come out of your mother's womb with your heart just beating for God. The Bible says you are born in sin. And shaped in iniquity. Anybody who does not believe the sinful nature does not have kids. <laughs> you do not have kids. I remember my son was two. My daughter was four. She took his Spider-Man. He walked over and grabbed a Fisher-Price uh, plastic baseball bat and was walking behind his sister like this. I'm like, how did you know how to do that? You never saw me walk behind Tanisha and say, you ain't cooked my woman yet. You ain't cooked my food yet, woman. You ain't do it. Come on. You ain't, how did you know? You took my Spider-Man. I'm going to bust you upside your head. How does he know that? <laughs> you don't have to teach sinful nature. You have to teach faithfulness. 
you have to teach faithfulness. This may sound basic, but a lot of us assume that you're faithful, but you don't spend time with the faithful one. Faithfulness is a God-like attribute. It is when we seek his face so much so to where our have to becomes our want to. I don't come home to Tanisha because I have to. I came home from work. I have to. No, I want to go home. I don't parent my son and my daughter because I have to. I want to. It's spending time with God in that intimacy where he changes the heart because words will lie. People will lie. But heart types don't. Heart types don't. Faithfulness. God is so faithful where he tells us, I watch over my word to perform it. God is so faithful where he'll be loyal to you even after you're dead. <laughs> That's next level, like, loyalty. Okay, the same way I was with your daddy, uh, Isaac, I'm also, I, the same way I was with your daddy, Isaac, Abraham, I'm also going to be with you. I'm that faithful. Yo, Joshua, Moses is dead. The same way I was with him, I'm going to be with you too. Because he's that faithful. His faithfulness is not on trial. Ours is. If you want to be a barber, you go to barber school. You want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. You want to be a doctor, you go to med school. But where do you go to train your heart on how to be kingdom? It's supposed to be church, but for some of us, the church has made our heart worse. And if we don't teach how to have biblical faithfulness, we'll end up being loyal to something that's toxic. Listen, loyalty to something that is toxic is a perversion of honor. I want them to know How to have faithful hearts. Number two, faithfulness is a choice to remain. For anybody who's like, I don't know what faithfulness is, it is a choice to remain. When it gets hard, remain. When it gets difficult, remain. When you don't get your way, remain. When it's uncertain, remain. When you don't like the routes, remain. When God changes your sermon Friday night, remain. When it hurts, remain. When I'm confused, remain. Faithfulness is a choice to remain. It is the anthem of allegiance. I'm not going anywhere, God. I don't like it, but I'm still going to worship you. I don't like the situation, but I'm not leaving you. Faithfulness. That's what God is saying. I'm looking for that. To be faithful in spirit is the greatest wealth. Faith on the inside, because that's what God is looking for. Faithfulness is an unwavering commitment. And hear me, y'all. Commitment takes a relationship. Commitment is the transportation system that takes a relationship from surface to depth. You want to go deeper with me? Be committed. Be committed. Your workout, be committed to it. Oh, yeah, the New Year's resolution, we, we're like ending, going towards March. Still stick with your commitment. Be faithful to it. Because I'm looking for a heart that is loyal towards me. The byproduct of pursuing God is the pursuit of holiness. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Somebody say it with me. Love, Love. joy, Love. peace. Patience, Patience. kindness, Kindness. goodness, Goodness. and what's this word? Faithfulness. You don't come out your mother's womb faithful. Faithful is a work of the Holy Spirit in your life and our intentional pursuit of choosing God. Faithfulness. Point number three, faithfulness is required for elevation. I know that this isn't your hype shouting message. I know that this isn't, oh, this is, this is my favorite one in the King Encounter series, but I understand what God was doing. I don't want them to have an expectation and never experience it because their heart is not changing. This message is to teach us how when God wants to do something strong in you, this is how I get him to do it, by being faithful. Being faithful, it is requirement for elevation. Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little 
will also be dishonest with much. This is countercultural because the culture teaches us if it doesn't fill you to the overflow, leave. If you can't flex with this, leave. You go where you can be satisfied. You're not satisfied at your house, leave and go find it somewhere else. And God is saying, even when there's little, nobody knows who you are, nobody knows your name, and you could possibly get away with it. I want you to be faithful in the dark. Because that is the key to elevation. And lastly, faithfulness is in serving. Where do you give freely where you don't get a paycheck? Where do you serve freely where you can't post about it? <laughs> God is saying, listen, I want them to know I'm looking for a man, for a woman. I'm looking for somebody to show off through. That's Bible, y'all. I want to show myself strong through. But the requirement is they have to have a heart of loyalty towards me. And I said, God, I believe now you're going to do something mega in this church and something mega in our life because we don't care about what people think. We just want you exalted. And if we can get just a few people in the house who are like, I'm not coming here out of religion. I'm not coming here out of just marking off some religious activity on my, on my spiritual to-do list. But I'm coming here because I want God. Then I could show myself strong. Having meetings. What are we going to do for Easter? We're running out of parking already. Look at the sanctuary right now. What are we going to do for Easter? Jerry, you're going to have to have two services. And I'm like, I'm not about to cater to people who only come to God on Easter. They get here late. They get here late. They ain't going to be here next Sunday anyway. Why would I exhaust myself for people who only want to be religious? There it is. Easter, New Year's, and Christmas. But I want us, seriously... To get to a place like, God, I repent. I repent for asking for transformation. Having the information, but not applying it to my heart. So, Father, in this moment, we hear you. Sometimes messages like this, God, are rough. <laughs> hard to hear, hard to really do a self-inventory of our own heart, God, but we don't want to stay in a place of stagnation. We don't want to be stuck on loading because our hearts aren't loyal to you. Would you forgive us for only coming to you when we want something? Would you forgive us for checking Facebook without first reading our Bible in the morning? Would you forgive us for being more faithful and protecting our phones more than we do our soul? Would you forgive us for caring more about what people think? Would you forgive us, God, for being so caught up with what the world has to offer that we forget that you're looking for somebody faithful so that you can show yourself strong? And we ask God, do it in us. Do it in us. Show yourself strong in us. Show out in us. Help us to be humble. Help us to be meek. Help us to be honest. Help us to be patient, God, because whatever you're doing, we don't want you to do it without us. Don't let us miss the blessing because our hearts are loyal to our flesh more than they are to your spirit. And Holy Spirit, would you help us and deliver us for trying to seek out dopamine hits to satisfy us and only you can do that. Only you can give us joy. Only you can give us peace. God, help us to stop running to what this world can offer to try to find peace. It's only in you. It's only in you, God. And help us to be people that when you alter our plans, when you interrupt our world, when you invade our space, we'll say, God, take the wheel because I'm not driving anyway. We're tired of being angry. We're tired of questioning your existence. Because of our rebellion change our hearts make them like clay clay right after the spring rain mold us and shape us oh God so that when you look through the earth you could see 
I have a son there. I have a daughter there. I have a worshiper over there. I have an intercessor over there. I have an evangelist over there. Would you search us, O oh God, and purge us from anything that will make us miss you? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout amen in the building?